Thank you for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to speak to you today about best practices and efficient strategies for generic topical product development. I will give you examples of the challenges and questions that may arise during development of this category of drug products and what would be the best way to get feedback from the agency related to these challenges. Um, this presentation reflects my views and not the views of FDA. Uh, so my presentation covers three main topics. Uh, first one would be uh, about considerations related to formulation of the test product. The second topic is related to bioequivalence strategy and approaches. And the third topic is related to physical and uh, structural characteristics, or Q3 characterizations, and the pack packaging configurations for a given topical product. So let's start with the first topic, which is related to formulation of the test product. So in order to identify an appropriate formulation for your uh, test uh, topical product, usually one of the main uh, steps or at earlier stage is to deformulate the reference product by doing reverse engineering. So then you can get an estimate of the level of ingredients that exist in the reference product formulation. And it's also helpful to then cross-check those uh, obtain levels with FDA's uh, inactive ingredient database, make sure um, those are supported by the maximum potency that are listed in the IID. However, you need to understand the limitation of information that uh, exists in the both F RLD's product label and FDA's IID. So um, sometimes uh, the complete information are related to inactive ingredient. Uh, may not be available in the IID or uh, may not be precisely listed in the product label. Um, for example, uh, with regards to the product label, uh, sometimes um, you may see that uh, a general terminology of an ingredient is used and the specific grade of, of that ingredient is not listed. So it's not clear what is reference product is using, what grade. Um, it, it, the same can be uh, exist in the IID where the specific grade may not be listed. Also, another example would be um, when the product uh, label mentions something like citric acid as one of the ingredients, but doesn't clarify whether it is citric acid monohydrate or dehydrate, or it may say like um, fragrance as one of the ingredients and doesn't list the components of that fragrance. So just to keep in mind, the inform uh, about the limited information that you can use from the product label and the IAD. Uh, when you have the um, composition table for your test product, the next, next step would be to develop a thorough understanding of the product by characterizing multiple batches of the reference product that includes both fresh and aged batches and try to identify the critical quality attributes or CQA uh, and failure modes for bioequivalence for that given product and formulate your test product the way that you match the CQAs of the reference product. The reason that we uh, recommend to evaluate and characterize both fresh and aged batches is that sometimes you may see a trend in CQA across the shelf life like um, CQA such as um, particle size or global size may grow and increase uh, throughout the shelf life. And um, if that's the case, then, for example, we don't want if a fresh batch of a test product matches its uh, particle size with an aged batch of the reference product where the particle size are already at their largest stage. And if that happens, then as the test product um, ages, maybe their particles grow larger and larger and would not match with their reference product anymore. So um, now let's look at an example of an hypothetical RLD. And I have to note that the information listed here is, uh, they are, is fix, fictional and were designed for educational purposes. So this hypothetical pro uh, product that we came up with, it's a topical cream. Um, so it's a complex dosage form, and it has two drug molecules. One API is tanazone, the other one is argomethacin. It's an oil in water emulsion, so it has a complex formulation, and it's a multi-phase system. Also, by deformulating, uh, you can uh, get the estimate of the level of inactive ingredients in that RLD, and by characterizing the reference product, one may know that uh, in the finished product, one of the API is completely dissolved, but the other API, tanazone, is partially dissolved and partially dispersed. Uh, the pH of the finished product is 5.5, and this reference product has two packaging configurations, is available both in tubes and non-metered pumps. So um, the generic product developers can submit their formulation uh, to the agency and get feedback. 
um, what we often see in their submission is that the app, generic applicants ask whether the formulation is uh, qualitatively Q1 and quantitatively Q2 the same as the reference product or not. What I want to emphasize here is that for topical drug products, uh, Q1, Q2 sameness is not what is relevant. What is actually relevant is whether a test topical product is acceptable for a proposed BE approach. And as you saw from the previous presentations in this session, there might be multiple BE approaches available for a topical product. And, uh, and Q1, Q2 sameness may not be expected for all of those BE approaches. And even for something um, like in vitro characterization based BE approach, where our PSG recommends formulation sameness, we actually mean that the test product should contain um, no difference in the inactive ingredients or other aspect of the formulation relative to the reference product that can significantly affect local or systemic bioavailability. And Q1, Q2 sameness is an example of that. And you saw from Dr. Rani's presentation um, examples of cases where the formulation may not be Q2 the same as the reference product. For example, when you have a pH adjuster that is targeted to match the pH, um, and it may be okay to have a different nominal amount than the reference product, and the formulation would be acceptable for in vitro characterization-based approach in that case. So uh, the take-home message is please try to phrase your question the way that you're asking uh, whether your proposed test formulation is acceptable for your proposed B approach, rather than asking about the Q1, Q2 segments. Now, uh, when you seek acceptability of a uh, proposed formulation, there are two situations. One is when the product-specific guidance is available and actually recommends formulation sameness, then you can submit this inquiry uh, as a control correspondence. And the second situation is when the PSG is not available or it recommends a different BE approach that uh, does not talk about formulation sameness, then um, you can submit a pre and the product development meeting request to the agency and submit some information about your development plan uh, bioequivalence approach and your um, formulation composition and get feedback. Now let's look at an example um, related to uh, that hypothetical product that, are that I introduced in the earlier slide. Um, on the left side here is the test formulation uh, for that hypothetical product and on the right is the uh, RLD formulation for that hypothetical product. And the question is, is the following test formulation acceptable for the in vitro BE approach? So um, when we compare these two formulations, one thing that stands out, one difference, is uh, in the test formulation, we have petrolatum USB, while in the RLD formulation, we have white petrolatum USB. So we have two separate USB monographs for these two ingredients. And uh, if the RLD formulation is using white petrolatum, which is a more refined version uh, of this ingredient, we expect for the um, test product to also use uh, white petrolatum USB, even though the product label may list petrolatum in this case. Um, and uh, and if, if it's using petrolatum USB, then the uh, formulation may not be acceptable for uh, in vitro BE approach. Another um, major difference is in the amount of mineral oil. Well, we have 1.7% for the test formulation uh, compared to 2% in the RLD formulation. This is about 15% difference. and probably may not be acceptable. Um, another issue with this test formulation is that the level of cetosterol alcohol exists at 12.5%. If you compare with the level in the RLD formulation, is within that plus minus 5% difference. However, in this case, for example, the IID limit um, for uh, this inactive ingredient for a topical product and similar context of use is 12%. So in this situation, maybe, um, Generic applicant needs to submit additional information or uh, studies to support the safety of 12.5% 12 12 level of this ingredient. There are other in differences uh, between these two formulations um, that are acceptable, such as a different amount of propylene glycol, where uh, it's about 5% difference between test and reference formulation, and also differences in the amount of um, sodium hydroxide. So again, this is a uh, here, sodium hydroxide function as a uh, pH adjuster, and uh, it may be acceptable to have a um, nominal amount that is different than the RLD, but uh, mentioning that you're going to target the pH of the reference product, which is 5.5. But overall, this test formulation may not be acceptable for the characterization-based B approach. 
Now, in the second example, um, we have a test formulation for that hypothetical product, and the question is, how would you change this test formulation below before submitting it to the agency for an assessment? So if you look at the name of the ingredients, for some of them, the compendial grade is reported, and for some of them, is not. And we have three ingredients where the amount is reported as a QS 200. So um, here is the corrected um, version of that formulation. The corrections are shown in blue, if you can see them. Uh, so we would recommend to uh, report quantitative nominal amount for each and every ingredient in the composition table. Even for something like water or pH adjusters, we want you to report a nominal value, and maybe you can clarify in a footnote that you're using them as a QS to target a certain pH. Also, we would recommend to uh, report quantitative nominal amount specified to the same number of decimal places, and uh, preferably at least two. Uh, and have it consistent along with your formulation table, and use the correct compendial grades and name of each excipient uh, in your formulation. And even if you're using a non-compendial grade, it would be very helpful to mention the brand name of that ingredient in the formulation table. Now let's move to the next topic, which is uh, about the bioequivalence approach. So for that hypothetical uh, RLD, by reading the product label, one may uh, find out that this RLD is indicated for relief of signs and symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis in adults. And one uh, ingredient, artomethacin, inhibits an enzyme that reduces the formation of prostaglandin, while um, tonazone is a corticosteroid drug with anti-inflammatory properties. So with this um, preliminary information, we can uh, predict what would be uh, the BE approach for this hypothetical product. So one of the potential BE approaches is a com combination of comparative clinical endpoint study and vasoconstrictor studies. And the reason for uh, VC studies here is, what, uh, is because one of the API is a corticosteroid. Another potential BE approach for this hypothetical product is in vitro characterization-based BE approach that uh, can be applied to almost all topical products. And it may or may not be needed to be combined with systemic PK, uh, PKBE study, depending on site and mechanism action of the drugs um, in this product. And the third option here would be a combination of in vitro characterization studies and in silico modeling approach. And for this third option, we will have examples in the coming presentation tomorrow, I believe, would be at session seven. Uh, so. If you want to focus on in vitro characterization-based approach from previous presentation, uh, you saw that we developed a modular and scalable framework for uh, these, uh, this kind of approach. And the B studies that are recommended as part, part of the in vitro characterization-based approach are really de uh, depend on the complexity of the product. So these complexities can be associated to the formulation. Uh, and dosage form of the uh, our reference product, whether it's a solution or it's a semi-solid, it's, it's a single-phase system or multi-phase system, and related to solubility of the drug in the formulation, um, and also to uh, site and mechanism of action, whether it's just local or it's both local and systemic. And in all these three categories, as we move from left to right, the complexities associated with the reference product or the product increases, and so do the potential failure modes for bioequivalence. Now let's look at some examples of different BE approaches for this hypothetical product. In example one, or scenario one, uh, imagine that the PSG for this product is available, and it recommends two types of studies, vasoconstrictor studies and comparative clinical endpoint study. For comparative clinical endpoint study, the primary endpoint is recommended to be evaluated after 24 weeks of treatment. Now imagine you, as a generic uh, applicant, want to conduct the comparative clinical endpoint study according to the guidance. However, you want to evaluate the clinical endpoint after six weeks of application or treatment rather than 24 weeks that, was, that is recommended in the PSG. How do you get feedback from the agency? Well, um, this, even though it may not be really an alternative B approach and can be uh, eligible for a co complex control correspondence, you may also be eligible to submit it as a product development pre and meeting request and submit uh, sufficient information to show that this uh, six-week study um, is uh, sensitive and is uh, clinically relevant, and it can differentiate, for example, formulation differences, et cetera. And you can take advantage of modeling and simulation methods to support these earlier time points. In scenario two, imagine the PSG is not available for this product, and you want to propose a characterization-based B approach. 
what studies you would include in this approach. So again, we go back to that, to our um, scalable framework. And because our hypothetical product is a topic called cream, then the, recommended, um, the recommendations related to characterization-based B approach would uh, include formulation sameness as the reference product, similar physical and structural properties as the reference product, equivalent drug release rate through a validated RBRT method, and equivalent rate and extent of permeation through human skin using a validated IVPT method. Now in scenario three, imagine that PSG actually recommends the in vitro characterization-based B approach. And this approach includes um, formulation sameness, Q3 similarity, IVRT, and IVPD. And also it recommends in vivo PKBE study. Now you as an applicant want to follow the PSG, but you're proposing to not, uh, to not do IVPT. Are you eligible for a pre-end product development meeting with an agency uh, for an alternative B approach? Well, if the PSG recommends multiple studies to establish BE and you want to leave one or two studies out of it, it's not really an alternative B approach and you're not eligible for a pre and meeting. But if you submit sufficient justification and propose alternative studies to provide relevant information, for example, in this case, about the cutaneous PK of the drug product to support your proposed BE strategy, then you may be eligible for a pre and meeting request, uh, meeting with the agency. Now, let's move to our last topic, which is related to physical and structural characterization, and uh, especially with, related, uh, with relation to our um, hypothetical product. Uh, the question is, what are the Q3 tests that can be recommended as part of in vitro characterization-based approach for this product? And I remind you that this RLD um, is an oil and water emulsion cream. So it's an emulsion. We expect um, to see globules in the formulation. And one of the APIs, tonazone, is partially dissolved and partially dispersed. So we expect to see the particles of that in the formulation and maybe different polymorph polymorphic form. So um, the recommended Q3 test may include but are not limited to assessment of appearance, microscopic images at multiple magnifications, pH, particle distribution, uh, particle size distribution of tonazone, global size distribution, polymorphic form and crystalline habit of tonazone, and rheological behavior of the cream product. Now, in the second example, imagine that you are developing a generic version of this hypothetical product, but only in one packaging configuration, the pump. Uh, and if you remember, I mentioned that this RLD has two packaging configurations, both tubes and pump. The question is, what data would be needed to support that your test product is bioequivalent to both packaging configurations? If you remember from the previous presentation, we saw examples uh, related to a cyclovir cream product where the microstructure of the formulation changed um, after dispensing out of the pump. And it, uh, and it resulted in having different uh, bioavailability between the tube formulation and the pump formulation. That's why in cases like this example, sorry. Um, our recommendation would be to perform the comparative Q3 test of your formulation, of the formulation inside both tubes, tube and pump and compare the formulation dispensed from the pump for both of the reference product and the test product. In conclusion, a good pre and product development meeting package should clearly characterize the complexity of the drug product, should contain the formulation composition of the test product, should provide clear and concise information about how these proposed studies can systematically mitigate concerns related to potential failure, mode, failure modes for BE, should contain sufficient data and rationale for, uh, to support every question that you have in the meeting package, should include information to support feasibility of any proposed novel techniques. And even if for something like IVPT, if you're proposing to do IVPT, it will be very helpful to submit some preliminary data of your proposed IVPT study. Um, and if modeling is involved as part of your BE approach, then we expect to see uh, a clear presentation of how this model will be used and how the model will be verified. Uh, so with that, I would like to thank uh, my colleagues and supervisors at US FDA, and thank you very much for your attention.